Joseph Valente is the founder and CEO of the Trademark Mind with an incredible CV and archive of awards and milestones behind him, such as winning the 2015 Apprentice Series and going on to the business partners with Lord Adam Sugar to being awarded National Installer of the Year, winning a place in the full 30 under 30 and having the number one best-selling book and podcast. Joseph, we are delighted to have you with us. Welcome to Talk Business with Thank you, David. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And what a great intro. Yeah, thank you. Most people will have first come into contact with you during your time on The Apprentice. But before we talk about that, tell us about what life was like prior to going on to the show. How far back do you want me to go? Well, you, I, I can imagine you were probably, probably an entrepreneur at school, JV, right? 100%. <laughs> so I take us know. back to then. Okay, sweet. Okay, cool. Um, so I suppose one of my first ventures at school um, was uh, selling football stickers. So, you know, back in the day, the Merlin books, and, you know, you used to get your 26p packs from the local corner shop, and you'd always hope to get a shiny in the pack. And um, you'd also get the same crappy players from teams like Nottingham Forest or Derby or Leicester at the time. And um, you'd get the same recurring heads. So, you know, you'd end up with three, four, five of them. So what I did, first and foremost, like when I was like year one, year two, year three, I'd always go down to the like the older kids' end of the playground and hustle the older kids and get them to swap me for better ones because I've always been good at um, doing deals. And uh, then I went home one day and I was like, right, because we didn't have any money growing up. And, you know, I used to get barely, I, I used to struggle to get the money together to get a packet. Um, so I was like, right, the ones that I have got, how am I going to recycle these? So me and my sister sat on the table, got bits of square A4, stapled them together and put all of the swaps in. So I had loads of um, double shinies and loads of um, double cards. Um, double stickers so we basically packaged them I sold them for 20p you got three more stickers in the shop and if they wanted a guaranteed shiny they got them for 40p so I went into school the next day with like um, I don't know it was about 15 packs of these things that I had sold a lot and I had £3.50 £3.50 at the end of the day straight down the corner shop bought a load more and so on so that was probably my first venture so if anyone knew you back then, they could have put a good bet on that you'd be on the Forbes 30 under 30. One day, right? <laughs> I think so. And then I think the old typical thing, you know, um, that many entrepreneurs do, started selling sweets, um, Pokemon cards, Pogs, Tazos, whatever the trend was, yo-yos, I managed to jump on it um, in some way, shape or form and, um, and, to, and to make some money out of it. Yeah. So you school didn't actually go to plan. You end up getting kicked out of school, right? Yeah, that's right. So, you know, I um in secondary school. So look, my mum and dad broke up when I was 13 and I came from quite a hostile um home life anyway. It wasn't a good place growing up. You know, my dad was an alcoholic and didn't work and it was just it wasn't great. So, you know, I was always disruptive anyway when he lived at home. So I'd go to school um, and I just didn't want to be there. And I'd always like have like a negative home vibe in my mind. And so um and so when my dad left at 13, I mean, I became a teenager that was lawless. So, you know, I didn't have any rules. My dad wasn't there anymore. And um, then, you know, you kind of do that thing where you just sort of explode. And I didn't want to listen to anybody. I wouldn't take, um, um, I wouldn't take um, instruction from anybody. I didn't want, um, you know, anybody telling me what to do in terms of authority. And then a couple of years went by. And obviously the teachers, as you get older as an adolescent, you know, and more cheeky, more gobby, more naughty, more brave, thinking that you know it all um so you know ended up, i got to a point where they just said um you've got to go you know you, you're too much friends we can't handle you that was a um i think 14 or 15 and i think i was just at the end of year nine when they kicked me out so when you left school you was actually able to turn that into a positive tell us about what you've done next joseph great yeah so you know there came a time at the end of it where at the at the time i was like yes this is brilliant i have to go to school i um, you know, i'm gonna go and hang around with my mates down the park and you know i hung i hung around with a lot of older children at that time you know 16 17 18 19 is like a 14 year old so i wasn't in a great crowd and you know i was influenced by those guys but i looked up to them because i didn't have a father figure it was kind of like you seek that from you know older guys in 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 the in you know in, in your environment and so um there came a day when i remember just looking around and i was sort of 
in the park with all of these older guys and you know I was just like wow man they're 20 and they're here and I'm 14 or 15 and I'm just like this isn't right I was like you know I'm gonna waste my life if I stay here um, and I don't do anything about it and you know I say to so many people when I left at 15 you know my mum had given up on me she thought I was finished and gone she didn't know what to do how to help me like I was unhelpable um getting in trouble all the time. My dad was gone. You know, I didn't speak to him when he left. I never saw him again. So he was gone. Um, and, you know, every, all the teachers and everything else. So I kind of rem- looked at myself and I said, listen, Joe, you've put yourself in this situation. If you don't do something about it, you're going to end up, you know, down the wrong path. You, your life is going to be a waste. And no one is coming to save you. Yeah, the cavalry isn't coming. You, if you want to drag yourself out of this situation, you've got to go do something about it. So I use that as motivation. One of the older guys that was one of the older guys was a 25-year-old. Um, he was the cousin of my best friend. He had a brand new BMW. He just started his own plumbing business. He was really good looking guy. You know, he was the guy um, around the town type thing. So I wanted to be like him anyway, because you always used to see him driving in his car through where we lived and so on. So I approached him and I said, listen, you've just started your business. Um, I want, I'm not at school. Can I come and work with you for a year for free? Um, and then when I'm 16, you put me into college, then start paying me. Like I'll come every single day. And I just want to learn. So, of course, he just started his business, so he wasn't going to say no. And um, I went to work with him every single day. I turned up on time because I respected him. I did what I was told, never answered back, always wore the uniform, was amazing with customers. And then, you know, that kind of gave me the intro into um, the plumbing world. And then at 16, he took up his part of the deal. He started paying me, and then my career really just went from there. Yeah. Well, let's fast forward a little bit because you've you've I've heard you tell this story a couple of times before and I just love it. I've heard you tell a story about when you overcome some early rejection when you went pitching to some estate agents in Peterborough. Tell us about yeah. that. Love it. OK, awesome. So I think um, I started my business at 22 and I did I did I did that because I was a plumber working for um, a plumbing and heating company. I was getting 50 grand a year at the age of 19. I got that wage. Yeah. Um, you know, by 21, I'm still getting it. But I wanted to go and start my own business, build my own company, um, create value in the marketplace. And I did that actually off the, re- off the back of reading Lord Sugar's book. That was what allowed me to quit my job, take out a 15 pound loan and start a business at 22 with no experience, no knowledge or anything. This is why the apprentice story is even more special. Yeah. because of what I did, because of reading his book at the age of 22. So I decided that I wanted to go into industry and I wanted to change the way that the construction industry was seen, the way that plumbers were looked at, the way that you pitch your products and services rather than turning up in dirty clothes in your van, you know, trousers um, down your backside, typical builder type thing. I thought, I'm going to get dressed up in a suit. I'm going to go in smart. I'm going to present myself in a completely different way. So without the £15,000 loan that I took out, I went and bought my first ever suit, a Ted Baker suit, pinstripe suit, looked like an investment banker. I bought a briefcase that had nothing in it. I bought a um, one of those umbrellas, suit umbrellas with the wooden handle, yeah, yeah. Uh, pocket, tie, shirt. And um, I was literally just busted into the estate agents, cold call up and down the high street. Hi, I'm Joseph Valente from Infragas. I could do service, maintenance, repair, um, you know, with the newest company in town type thing. And I just went in there and I was pitching that out, which was awesome. And, um, you know, they kind of looked at me like, who the hell is this guy? Yeah, he's like young looking 22 year old. He's in a suit pitching plumbing and eating services, cold calling as straight away as he's walking into the estate agent. And everybody said, oh, great, you know, intrigued, like, okay, well, um, give us your card or whatever it may be. And then um, I got turned down by all of them. And that this was, I was expecting that they were just going to say yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. I just bought the van, I'd quit my job, and I was like, whoa, what do I do now? So, I did a couple of jobs in between that week. And then on Friday, I said, right, you know what? I'm going to go back. Um, I've got no choice. I'm going to go back. And that was like my first ever lesson of rejection and hard, cold sales and, you know, never giving up and resilience. And I went back around it. A lot of them said, what are you doing back here? You were only here a couple of days ago. And I didn't have another suit, which was hilarious. 
I had, you know, I had to just like, what did I do? I think I borrowed one of my stepdad's ties, get the same shirt on, same suit and everything else, because I hadn't bought two suits yeah. Yeah. or any other shirts, I had the same one. Um, so I did that, went back around there, and I ended up signing two estate agents up with 600 homes each. I'm sorry, 600 homes combined, and then literally my business just exploded. Yeah. I mean... We went, they said, right, okay, because on the second visit, they were like, okay, well, he's back. He's not going anywhere. He's committed. And actually, they were like, well, our guys let us down. Can you do these jobs? I was like, yeah, I'll do them straight away tomorrow. Yeah. We'll send them to your inbox. Next day, 30 jobs hit the inbox. I was a one man in a van. I did 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. Next day, 30 jobs hit the inbox. It went like that. It just evolved within my first week. I had my first apprentice. Within my first month, I had my first perma. First three months, I had my first office. Um, and it just grew and grew and grew from there non-stop. How did you come to apply for The Apprentice? And what was the audition process like? Okay, so going back to um, the age of 22. So my mum got me Lord Sugar's Auto. I've got to tell this part because it's critical to the later part. So my mum got me Lord Sugar's autobiography when I was 22 years of age. I just got back from living in Australia, okay, and I went back to my same job. It's a little bit depressed, a little bit demotivated. It was Christmas of 2011. Big, big book, what you see is what you get. Read it cover to cover for three weeks. And what I saw was a guy come from a poor background, was able to go on and build billionaire wealth in one lifetime. And I thought, you know, because I'd always believe that truly successful people must have come from a different world. You know, I didn't think that that was accessible to me where I grew up. Nobody thought like that. Nobody talked about that type of stuff. So it kind of opened up my eyes that somebody with nothing had made it. So why can't I? So that's when I quit my job, took out a £15,000 loan um, and bought a van and went to work. So I'm a big believer in the law of attraction. Like I live my life by manifestation, affirmations, goal setting, repetition, vision, belief and so on. And so I believed that I was going to go and work with him. Now, 2013, I was tweeting him, telling him I was going to go and work with him, going to go and meet him. And actually, when they picked me to win, the papers picked up the tweet. They went back through and said, hang on, you were going to meet him in 2013, were you? I was like, no, 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 no. That was just me being a crazy um, <laughs> universe uh, law of attraction set of putting it out there. And it came true. So basically on January the 9th, 2015, um, fast forward three years, three years fast forward, I was 25. I'd built my business to half a million a year. I had seven guys working for me um, and I'd hit my ceiling as a businessman. I was a plumber that had started a plumbing business. I needed cash, I needed mentorship and I needed exposure to keep growing. So what I did was go, I came in at nine o'clock on uh, January the 15th, it was, I believe. And um, it was a very cold and dark night. I can remember it so well, walking into the kitchen. I was in a demotivated, my business was making money. I was doing really well for 25, but I just wanted more. And then I got my phone out. I can still see it standing next to the fridge. Got my phone out. Lord Sugar's Facebook page came up. The final call for The Apprentice, 24 hours left. At that very moment, I knew the universe had sent a sign. They sent a sign to say, Joseph, this is your opportunity. Okay, so I put my details in. Then um, a few weeks later, uh, an email came back. And I nearly missed it for some random reason. I was watching a film at like 1 a.m. And then uh, on a Friday night, and um, I was like, you know what? Let's go back through my Mighty Joe inbox because I was using my imprint. I replied with Mighty Joe email and I just didn't look at that one. Went back through it and I saw it. An audition and it was like three days away or something crazy. I was like, what? Yes, I remember bringing my mum at 1 a.m. Like, she was like, what's it, what was wrong? Um, and um, applied for the show. Uh, it was a brutal audition process, brutal, very tough. Out of like 60,000 people apply, um, then only 18 get on the show. There was loads of rounds. It took about six or two, eight weeks, back and forth, back and forth to London. Then um, they accepted me as one of the 18 and um, off I went on to the show. And the rest is history, as they say. Joseph, how yeah. do you look back at your time on The Apprentice now? And what are the highlights and lowlights that stand out for you these years later? Uh, so how do I look back on it? I just look back on it as um, probably 
a define it's just a defining moment you know a defining moment and um i look back on it very very fondly uh, it was five years ago i look back on it with um gratitude no regret and you know just blessed that i was given the opportunity and when the universe sent me the sign that i was open enough to be able to see it because i do believe that there is opportunity everywhere and i do believe many people are blinkered in their day to day and they're just not aware of the opportunity so I'm just glad that when it landed, I didn't just click off and go and grab something out the fridge, like my dinner or whatever it was, and then I took I took that chance. Yeah. And um, and what was the rest of the question? What was the highlights and lowlights? Yeah, yeah. Lowlights. Don't know if I've said that one before. Is that the right thing? Yeah. Highlights and lowlights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obviously the lowlights were um, were winning. I think and uh, not winning. I was going to say highlights. The low part was, um, was there any lows? I, I found um, I found the process challenging. I don't think it was necessarily a low. We were away for nine weeks. Yeah. I put my business on the line to go. You know, we were doing half a million a year. I was running the business. I was everything in the business. I was the sales, the operation, the manager, the customer service. I had loads of field-based resource, but I was a machine in the office. So I only had a part-time um, lady that was, you know, in her 50s that was doing um paperwork and stuff in the day so i had no management or back office support and i told her and she said to me um because i could only tell four people when i was going on there and um, she said to me um you know what joe because i said to her look if i go debbie you know this business could fold because i've got to go away for nine weeks and um you know i'm not going to be able to contact the business they say i can't bring back so I'm gonna. What am I gonna do? And she was like, "Joe, I'll step up for you. I'll take it on. Um, I know you can do this. I know you win." And I went away for nine weeks, and I didn't speak to her for two months. You know, and I built that business night and day, seven days a week for three and a half years. Yeah. So I risked my business to go and um, with the slim chance that I was gonna win. In my chart, in my head, it was hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, but um, so that was kind of a challenge. And then the highlight was meeting some of the people, made some great friends that I'm still in a group with now, you know, good relationships. And um, winning, of course, was a major highlight. Having that experience of being known by so many people, you know, it was like when you say 15 minutes of fame, it, it was a 15 minutes of fame for a good period of time, but there was 9 million people watching it a week. So I became an instant star. You know, it was everywhere I went, selfies, VIP access, interviews, events, like London gigs, like it, it was just everything. So it was amazing in all honesty. Yeah. So much female attention, you know, it was brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it was incredible. <laughs> So, so good. So that was a highlight for sure. For anyone following you on social media, we'll see how much attention you still get even today, JV. And one of the things that always stands out for me is the amount of people that try and troll you. Yeah. How, how do you deal with that? And does it actually get to you? Because, I mean, you come across as this ultra-confident guy. But are there moments where these actually do penetrate the armour? Great question. Um, you know, and at the age of... when I was 25 when I went on the show. And when you put yourself out there, people are going to hate. You know, I got absolutely rinsed. Um, on loads of stuff, you know, um, with the moustache that I had at the time, you know, the way that I spoke, the way that I did anything, you know what it's like, especially with Twitter. I also had loads of fans and loads of haters. So I kind of was used to it from very, very early on, you know, and now it dies down. Whenever you're not around, it, it calms down. But when you go big and you're doing stuff like this brand here, King of Construction, like when that hits the market, go, people are going to hate, hate, hate. The king of construction, who does he think he is calling himself the king of construction? I'm like, bring it on, bring it on. Um, so, you know, we run a lot of Facebook ads at the moment and sponsored Facebook ads. So when you run those, you get a lot of like keyboard warriors coming on. But in all honesty, I'm bulletproof now. I you know, know, I've been through, I've been to the top, I've been to the bottom, I've been to the top, I've taken shit from every single angle you could imagine. It, it's like water off a duck's back. Actually, I quite enjoy it now, weirdly. Yeah. I'm just like, yeah, go on, what you got? I've heard that one before. 
And then I'll click on their profile pic and I'll be like, man, what a joke. You know what I mean? So kind of doesn't bother me. But for many people, it does. But, you know, if you're going to put yourself in that world, put yourself out there, you're going to get it. Even like just like building your own brand on Insta or TikTok, these guys, they get absolutely battered by people, but they're, they're not people, you know, wolves don't um, worry themselves over opinions of sheep, you know? Yeah, so. yeah. Once the cameras are off, here you are in business with Lord Adding Sugar. Tell us about that, Joseph. So, you know, after starting a business because of read, reading his book, and I was so passionate about it, to three years later, him buying half my company for a quarter of a million pounds, it's just mind-blowing. You know, it's just like, how does that shit even happen? You know, how does that happen? That, you know, and so um, it was uh, incredible and challenging and stressful and exciting. And, you know, he was like my idol. So I just wanted to, a, a young 25 year old, you know, once again, he was my idol. So I just wanted to um, show him that I could do it, show him that I was the best, like be the best that, that I could be. And he's a tough guy, he's hard. To be around people think i'm hard at work you know, i'm nothing compared to how he is like he will take your life in a second yeah and i was a confident guy you go into a room with him you're scared yeah, yeah? And you say one thing wrong you move once wrong you make the wrong noise that's it oh like the first meeting i went into with him after all this stuff had gone and everything else no cameras the real boardroom I remember him sat there, he was like this. He's like this. <laughs> I walked in the room, right? And the board meeting was behind you. I walked in the room, turned around like this. No eye contact. No eye contact. No hello. But I went to put my hand out. He ignored it. Joseph, sit down. That's all it was. And I was just like, whoa, shit. This is how it's going to be. But actually, I appreciate that level of um, no BS, because I'm straight to the point. In business situations, you know, I like to talk, but I also don't like to talk pointlessly. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it, the no waffle works for me. Fine, okay, straight, here we go. This is what I've got to say to you. This is how we do it. Job done. So that was kind of how it went. And, um, yeah, it was, it was cool. It was cool, but it was challenging. I mean, after a couple of years, we'd, you know, grown the business and I'd taken the um, advice and I'd, got the investment and you know we've got the attention that we wanted but they were not a field-based um a service business they'd never have been didn't know the world didn't know the industry didn't know how to operate it they helped with our financial infrastructure to build systems and processes and all that type of stuff but when we tried to scale they didn't really have a lot of value. So it became me going to the um, me going to the boardrooms and them saying, okay, Joe, what are we are going to do here? And I'm like, listen, man, I didn't come here to tell you what we're going to do. I came to get help. Like, I don't, I don't claim to have all the answers. And it was very difficult. Your boardroom politics at that level is something that I'd never experienced. There was, you know, obviously him, then his people, then his people want to try and score points in a board meeting to say that they've like, done good work and then it would like impact what I was doing. And, you know, I'm just don't stand for that stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, I can't stand it. So I'd call them out and then there'd be rows and, you know, it was heat and shouting board moves, um, you know, which is crazy. When I think back a bit now, um, yeah, just in the boardroom, with Lord Sugar was just all shouting. Uh, but um, then one day I said, listen, you know, uh, this isn't where I want to be. I want to take it and scale it. And if you risk, if you're worried about it failing, then let me do it. And if it screws up, then I'll take it on my shoulders and your name isn't involved in it. So let me buy you out, go from there. He said, look, okay, I respect you. Fine, fine, fine. We did a deal. We arranged and we and I exited. Yeah, yeah. How much sort of contact do you get with him? Are you sort of in like a WhatsApp group with him and Karen and, you know, all the rest of the team sending each other updates on the phone? Funny enough, yeah. I've still got him on WhatsApp. And on, yeah. a, on an occasion, he'll WhatsApp me, mostly kicking off about something. But he'll still WhatsApp me. Uh, <laughs> and um, so these are speak to it's weird that it's happening on WhatsApp. Yeah, I mean, you know, on WhatsApp, when like you see that somebody's put a WhatsApp story on, 
Yeah. Nobody really uses WhatsApp stories, right? Yeah. No sugar does. The old guy says, no, nah, that's not cool. That's not cool. <laughs> <laughs> so he uses it. Um, so um, you, you meet him once a month and um, you can have him by phone and email. Obviously, I've still got his number and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. One of the brilliant things that I think will be really helpful to a lot of people listening is six months into your business, you made a really brave decision to change things up. And it's a real goldenness. Tell us about that, JV. OK, cool. So um, I think, you know, and it's very relevant to this moment in time as well. You, when something isn't working, you've got to pivot. We, we were working for, um, you know, property management companies doing call outs like like small ticket, um, high volume, reactive maintenance work. And as the business scaled and, you know, after the apprentice, we wanted new warehouse and new vans and all of that type of stuff to build the image. The client base didn't, um, the client base wasn't the right client base for the company that we wanted to be. It's like British Gas doing work for, you know, small estate agents. It just ain't going to happen right? Because they ain't going to pay enough. So I had to change strategy because it wasn't working. So, you know, I had to pivot the business model quickly. And I did that by changing into installation. So one off boiler installations nationally, there was a huge demand for it. There was um, 1 million boilers installed a year, big order value, two and a half grand a job, not 50 pounds a job. And um, I knew that I could get the leads and scale up and it matched my ambition. So that is what I um, decided to do. And it was a big, big risk. Um, but the way that we were doing it at the moment wasn't really working anyway. And it was, we couldn't scale it. So I had to make that move and go all in. And, you know, we went all in. And, um, you know, I ended up scaling that to an eight-figure national company within a few years. Yeah. Taking things forward, um, you ended up leaving Impergas and that ended up um, folding. Have you learned more from your successes or more from your losses? Um, I would say it's 50-50. I think, you know, <clears throat> one thing that is challenging in business is success and how to handle it. Because people don't know how to handle success. That's for damn sure if they're not used to it. Um, and also people don't know how to handle failure if they're not used to it. So it's kind of like this is where a lot of people just stay safe because they know that there's no risk for the downside and they know there's no super success that they're going to have to explode with. I've been all the way to the top. I've been straight down to the bottom. I've been back up again. Um, so I think 50-50. Um, to answer that with a um, quote is success isn't guaranteed and failure isn't final. Yeah. There came a time where I felt like that whatever I touched turned to gold from 22 starting a business. It just went so well. And then like winning the apprentice, then it went to, um, then it went to, um, you know, writing a number one bestseller spell from the classroom to billionaire boardroom. Then it went to having a number one podcast in the world on iTunes. Then it went to IOD direct for the year, Forbes 30 under 30 out of 18,000 candidates in Europe. You know, just awards after awards with Infragas, winning national installer of the year in 2019, beating British Gas. It was almost like, what, you know, I just do anything I want. Everything I touch, I conquer. So when my business hit hard times financially, now we were a huge organization, 100 plus people, um, eight figure turnover it made in every major city in the UK. When the sales dried up because of market conditions, you know, it meant that the whole business was under a financial um, strain and it wasn't going to sustain. So I had to chop it up, I had to sell parts of it, shut parts of it down. And it was a very difficult time. And, you know, the company that I sold it to, took all the staff, the customer warranties. I made sure all of that happened, that they built a business that would trade with the debtors um, and the, the suppliers that had lost money from my shutting down part of the business. So I did my best to make it a good situation. And unfortunately, they ended up folding in like um, June time, I believe, because um, the pandemic wiped them out. So, you know, it was one of them once. It didn't happen then. The pandemic might have took us down anyway. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot, a lot of people sustained and survived. So I think, you know, January, um, January 2020, I found myself in a position where I was back to square one. Yeah. You know, I was, I was okay financially, um, but I'd gone all in with him for, I expected that company to make me a multi, multi-millionaire. Spent eight years of 
graft in that from a young boy to a 30 year old yeah. and it was a very bitter pill to swallow you know i'm not going to pretend it wasn't it hit me very very hard i was worried about my name i was worried about my reputation i was fuming that i'd lost you know what i felt was going to make me a very rich man i poured my heart and soul into it yeah i was a bit embarrassed it was it wasn't a very good time at all so you know but in in that in that um in that lesson, I feel like you know back to where I am. I could talk openly about it now. If you'd have met, had this podcast with me in like June time last yeah. year, I would probably still have yeah. been a bit tender. Yeah. 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 But now we're back in the game on a big big scale. So I feel like I've proven a point to myself that I'm not a failure. Yeah. That business just didn't work at that level. Yeah. Um, and that whatever happens, you can bounce back and, you know, you can overcome your demons. And I took a lot of shit from that situation. The press, a lot of abuse on social, a lot of other things behind the scenes, you know. And so actually it's made me strong. Yeah. So strong. Yeah. And you hear these opportunities and stories all the time. Entrepreneurs build quickly. They bust it out. They build again because they know the second time what to do right based on what they did wrong the yeah. first time because yeah. you don't know what you don't know yeah. and we scaled to the largest independent boiler installation company in the uk from a sole trader to national in seven years it's unheard of in the construction game it's so resource heavy it's not like scaling an online business where it's all algorithms and you know to shopping carts and drop shipping yeah you know it's a very people driven business so we scaled so fast and so quickly um and um, yeah, so I believe the lessons in the failure for me were I can do it again, I can rebuild, I can pivot. Success isn't guaranteed, failure isn't final. Um, and you know, actually, you learn from the lessons and all the negativity that's happened as much as you know. And at those times, you asked me earlier about taking shit online, you know, when it was when I was down and out early part of 2020, it was, I was, you know, looking at my phone and going, oh, God, what's, what's going to be like now? And then to go online and push yourself again, push your brand saying, listen, I'm now doing um, this. I'm doing a training business in construction. I'm, you know, training companies how to scale and sell. And then they're like, ah, oh, you can't do that. Your yeah. last business is this. Or not knowing still how successful we were. Yeah. So that was challenging to be that brave to then, you know, hit it again and go, I can do this. Yeah. So kind of push through that. And um, yeah, I think, uh, I think it's a crazy journey, you know. And here we are now, knowing that there's a big difference between creating a business and creating a job for yourself. And you put yourself in this brilliant position now where you've been able to pull together all of this learning that you've just been speaking about from the wins and the losses and now coach and mentor tradespeople to be the best that they can be. Tell us about that. OK, cool. So um, look, in January, I looked at right, what am I going to do next? I didn't really want to build another construction company. Um, I'd done that, been there, done it, got the T-shirt. Um, I'm a big, um, I'm a very, very passionate um, person. I've got a lot of knowledge, skills and understanding. I love sales. I love training. I love um, development. And I always wanted to be in the personal development world, right? The um, the Cardones, the Vaynerchuks, the Tony Robbinses, like that always excited me being in that world. And I thought, what was the biggest challenge that I faced as a construction business owner? Well, actually, it was that I was a plumber that had started a plumbing business. I wasn't a businessman. So, you know, I went to college for three years to train how to be a plumber and a gas engineer. And I started a business by taking out a loan and registered a company. I bought a van and went to work. That's what everyone does. Yeah. Yeah. So why was nobody teaching me how or why was there no information around of how to start scale and grow, how to drive sales, um, drive leads, build infrastructure, manage cash flow, um, build teams, you know, recruit and so on. And I thought, there's got to be a huge opportunity here. And no one was training in the construction space. So I started into my socials, offering one-to-one -one coaching. Got 15 clients overnight, 15 grand a month coming in straight away. Then um, me and my PA were going to do events with our events team that we were starting to build. March came, boom, that was gone. Yeah, lockdown hits. Then I took it online. The online training program started selling free webinars, pumping money into Facebook ads, and it's gone. 
like this. You know, it has skyrocketed. We've now trained about three and a half thousand businesses. We've done over seven figures in sales in 10 months. I've got 350 paying clients. Um, we've got 14 new staff. I've moved to 2,000 square feet offices. This is kind of like my studio office room. Um, you know, and you go look on our trust pilot out of 400 clients, you know, the satisfaction rate we have is like 98%, but we've got 30% positive review based just off those ones you can't say, you know what it's like to get positive reviews from yeah. customers. Yeah. You know, it's a challenge and it's best. We've got a hundred and something. So all saying of how it's helped them change their lives and everything else. So, you know, I think it's been absolutely incredible. We've made a real impact for people and businesses. And you know, this is why I'm going with the king of construction. I've rebranded. We're going hard in the construction space. At the, at the moment, I own the market um, and I plan to own it for a very, very long time. I don't think there's anybody like me in the space. And um, I own the failure now. I own the success. The fact that I failed on such a large level means any small business's micro failure. I dealt with that in my sleep. Yeah. I dealt with that before breakfast. Yeah. You know, so it was like uh, there is nothing that these guys can't answer me, ask me that I can't help them with. And that's what makes us extremely valuable. People go, oh, it's just about the success. No, a good coach and a mentor will stop you making the mistakes before you make them. Yeah. That is the value. Forget about telling you how to drive leads and grow sales. That's super valuable. But to stop you from, you know, I spent millions on advertising in the last few years, millions of pounds. So I know what to do, what not to do, and so on. I've hired 400 people over the last seven years. Yeah. You know, I've changed markets. I've entered into new cities all across the UK. There isn't nothing I haven't seen happen. I've had legal battles. I've done this. I've done that. I've watched what to happen when a company is crumbling, okay, and you're trying to grab at it, and there's, you know, what can you do about it? Like, it was like... I've watched what you need to do, who you need to bring in, how you need to bring in them, what your best exit is as the director and the owner, how to mitigate and reduce the damage and the risk and everything else as it's going down. You know, because limited companies are limited companies. Just because you are the CEO and a majority shareholder of a business, a limited company is a, C a separate legal entity that trades with another limited company, which is a separate legal entity. So it's not personal as far as I'm concerned, right? Don't get me wrong. It's not nice when something bad happens, but that's the whole point of business. Yeah. It is business. It's not yeah. personal. So um, whenever a company's in trouble, because let me tell you, I had a great mentor. Right, they had a, f a 50 million um, car business, car sales business, and he'd had to put it into administration when he was young. He'd done so well, and he's incredibly doing incredibly well now. And I had him as my mentor, a guy that was coaching me and so on. And it, that through those times when that was going down, he was telling me what to do, how to protect myself, you know, what to do, and so on, and what to expect, what was coming, and that was invaluable. Yeah, that was invaluable. So when things go wrong, having somebody that you can reach out to that's been through it helped so much because it was an uncharted water, a very unknown experience. And, um, you know, thank God I had him as my advisor going through that. As You know, I wouldn't have known what to have yeah. done. Just wrapping this up, JV, because I know how busy you are. There's going to be loads of tradespeople listening who have been dreaming of getting off of the tools for years, but not knowing how to do it. Who are your perfect customers in terms of getting in touch with you? What would your sort of call to action be if any of those people are listening right now? So we say start up to 10 million because we can teach everything up to that level at a different level. I can teach you how to put in a senior management um, team. I can show you how to, um, you know, start and register your company. So we go all the way from the bottom to the top. I'd say the majority of our clients are between the quarter of a mil and um, two million turnover bracket. And they are businesses that are looking to make that transition from tradesmen to businessmen. They may be a sole trader or they may have a few guys working for them but they've got no systems and processes it's all very manual very messy maybe um busy fools that aren't profitable because they're just churning 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 and churning and um you know what we do is help them um gain the knowledge that they need to be able to scale our flagship product is the trade accelerator university that we've created 24 hours of online learning 12 modules from business strategy to finance, the sales, marketing, planning, recruitment, and more. So we really give the tools and the fundamental skills to be able to scale up and grow because it's knowledge and education that everybody lacks. You know, and as I said to you earlier, most guys in the trade are tradespeople running trade businesses. Yeah. 
they had great knowledge at the job, hands yeah. on, but they don't have any business knowledge. Yeah, brilliant. JV, thank you so much for your time. I've really enjoyed speaking to you. What no is problem. the best way for people to keep in touch with your journey? Uh, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, um, probably the most active on Insta, Clubhouse is now a big one. Um, so it's at Mr. Joseph Valente, Facebook. There's a, I, I, what's, what, what, who's the, who's the um, majority audience that listen to this? Is it all business people or trade business? Yeah, yeah, entrepreneurs and small business owners. Okay, sweet. All right, cool. Well, we've got two Facebook groups. There's Business Breakthrough and there's um, the Trade uh, Mastermind. Okay, brilliant. Well, we'll put links to all of those in the description below, as well as a link to uh, JV's podcast and book on Amazon as well. Joseph, thanks, thanks again for your time. Really enjoyed it. Awesome. Thank you, buddy. Take care. Thank you.